the largest creatures on Earth live in the ocean. Their sheer size has always triggered our imagination. In murky waters or inaccessible places, we ignored their true nature and created legends. Today, scientists try to understand them, to go beyond the myths. But stranded or fished creatures offer a poor glimpse into their world. So how can we decipher their underwater secrets without altering their behavior? Venturing below the surface is a first step into a different world. One man has dedicated his life to this quest. He offers marine biologists around the world a unique way of approaching the animals they study. He free dives. This equinaut travels beneath the surface, using only the air trapped in his lungs. I suggest the encounter, but the initiative comes from the animal. He approaches the giants of the sea to photograph, identify, or tag them. I usually work with scientists on missions which they could not carry out, other than with the assistance of a freediver. A concrete example is the tagging of sharks. For scientists, he has become the eyes of the big blue. But what led him there? Who is this elegant link between myths and knowledge? Can he reconcile us with our ancestral fears of the unknown? My name is Fred Boyle, and I've been a freediver since, well, the age of four or five. I inherited my father's love for the sea. He always had a boat. When I was born, he was building one in the yard. We used to spend several months a year on a sailboat. He really passed on to me this passion for the sea. He wasn't a diver himself, but he made me want to go out on the water, and I transformed this into a desire to go underwater. Those sailing trips gave me the opportunity to spot my first sea giants, orcas, the largest dolphins of them all. Thanks to marine aquariums, I was able to approach their cousins, the porpoises. With a mirror, I realized they were aware of themselves. Of their own image. I came to the conclusion that there was a form of intelligence under the surface. I just wanted to understand this and discover all the other marine animals. I quickly turned to books to get more information, even before I could read. But just with the illustrations, I would tell myself all sorts of stories. Those books allowed me to travel. Among them, there was a very old book bound in leather and written in Latin in the 17th century by one of the first Italian naturalists. Even his name was an invitation to travel, Ulysses Aldrovandi. I read this book eagerly for years. It was centuries old. 
and it gave me the vision that the ancients had of the underwater world. Some fish were known. We have pretty detailed descriptions. The drawings and the prints are very close to what can be observed. Take a sea bream, for example. It was described very precisely. For some marine animals, however, naturalists only knew small parts of their bodies, such as the jaw or the rostrum. From there, they tried to imagine the animal to which those parts belonged. That's how we ended up with a bestiary of supernatural creatures and animals looking very different than they do in reality, but that sprung up from the imagination of the illustrators. I think those old books led to some vocations. They enabled men to master their fear of the sea and inspired them to go out and unveil its mysteries. That's what the Aldrovandi did to me. It set me dreaming. In Belgium, imaginary monsters have always been part of the landscape. I was fascinated by the gargoyles. There are an incredible variety of them, and no two are alike. A legend even says that the gargoyles start screaming when evil approaches. I suspected that just like in those old books, the creatures were inspired by real animals. But as Belgium was no longer a wilderness, these creatures necessarily came from the sea. One winter morning, the ocean introduced me to one of its mysteries. On the beach near my house, a storm had washed up a giant. I had never imagined I could come that close to a whale. No recent book explained the stranding of whales. Yet my old bestiary mentioned them. I could recognize a whale that had a square forehead and a side vent. Just like in the illustration, it only had teeth in its lower jaw. And what teeth! My book called it the monstrous whale. Later on, I learned that it was called a sperm whale and that it dived very deep. Its skin was covered with mysterious round-shaped scars. These were like hieroglyphs that needed to be deciphered. Standing alongside that decaying carcass, it was as if the dead whale put a spell on me. I was hooked. Now, not only did I want to go underwater, but I wanted to explore the bottom of the sea and enter the world of the sperm whale. After that, I saw other cetaceans stranded on the Belgian coast. It made me both sad and intrigued. When I was making my first steps as a scientist, I really wanted to learn, and that curiosity made me grow. Over the years, 
my father's sailboat would venture further and further out to sea. To the Azores, for example. During our long travels, each stop was an opportunity to understand how men interacted with their environment, how they exploited its wealth. The Azores are indeed a rich land. Sperm whales are part of the culture. A very ancient culture that has been well preserved. Sperm whales, fishing and volcanoes, that's their identity. And yet the islanders have not always been kind to sperm whales. Up until the 1980s, sperm whales were hunted and cut up for their fat. Since then, oil and public opinion have transformed these whaling stations into museums. The hunters have become gamekeepers and naturalists. They found out that sperm whales eat huge squid and sometimes found them dying on the surface. The suction marks on their skin, that could be from them. To find out, I had to go below the surface. When I started going into the water with my snorkel to observe fish, the first thing I did was, of course, to try to identify them. I had seen them in the book and recognized them in the water. But what was different was their behavior. Because in the book, the fish are described. You see a plate describing a fish, but you just don't know what it does. I could spend many minutes observing a parrotfish. I knew it was a parrotfish. I could recognize the animal from the book, but I had no idea what it did. So I would watch it, watch how it moved, and that would keep me busy for hours. Even insignificant animals, such as sea urchins, I could spend long minutes watching them move, watching their thorns move. Those animals that were flat and well described in the book, very nicely drawn, they would come to life. It was really surprising because they did things I didn't expect. So that added a whole dimension to the animal. The young Fred Boyle's choice is made. His life will be dedicated to the underwater world and its creatures. Fred is back home in Belgium, diving in cold and murky waters. To make his childhood dream come true, 
he starts training to become a freediver in a lake. When you first start to freedive, the most difficult part is to acquire the technical skills, a good swimming technique and the ability to really relax. Once the technical aspects are mastered, you have to work on your physical condition. In freediving, there's an interesting connection between the technical, physical and mental skills. You go down into the depths, a hostile, cold and dark environment. So it's a bit against our nature, and you have to really try to put that out of your mind. After years of experience, that comes naturally. But in the beginning, it's perhaps the hardest thing. After that, of course, the mental capacity takes over. And just like in other activities, when you reach a certain level, all athletes will pretty much have the same technical and physical capacities. What makes the difference is the mind. Freediving is a sport in which the mind is really essential because you're dealing with humanity's primal fears. Being mentally flexible and able to deal with that type of emotion will make a big difference and allow you to progress. In a few years, Fred Boyle will beat all the previous freediving records in fresh water. But the records were not important to him, merely a pretext to meet the creatures of this dark world. Catfish. They can measure up to eight feet and weigh over 220 pounds. These fearful giants had already been identified by Aldro Vandi. They will remain fleeting memories, obscure ghosts. But Fred's choice is very clear. With this tough training in murky waters, Diving in the clear waters of the ocean will be easy. He can now test himself against the world's best freedivers. Tous les sondeurs éteints. Il est 7h40, premier top officiel dans 15 minutes pour le premier ouvreur. It was a time in my life during which I realized that human beings have no limits other than those that they set for themselves. But it's also important to stay within one's limit. It's also a time to learn about oneself, about what one is capable of enduring and of achieving. If you analyze a fairly deep free dive, it can be broken down into several phases. The first phase is one of relaxation and introspection on the surface to be as relaxed as possible. The key to free diving is being relaxed. So you have to breathe very slowly, slow down the whole body, 
to leave with a heart rate as low as possible. Then you duck dive to sink below the surface. The first meters are, I won't say violent, but they require some strength to overcome the buoyancy. So you first fin quite energetically, and then slow the finning down gradually as you go down. Everything slows down. At that point, you are very focused on the dive, trying to empty your mind and only concentrate on sensations. Around 20, 25 meters, you gradually slow down your fin movements and completely stop around 30 to 35 meters. Then comes the most enjoyable part of the deep dive, when you slide towards the sea bottom. So you stop moving your fins, just concentrating on clearing your ears, emptying your mind, and sliding one meter per second towards the targeted depth. That's the best part, very pleasant. You have to make pressure your ally. Every 10 meters, you have one kilo per square centimeter of additional pressure. That's a lot. And there's huge pressure on the entire surface of your body. If you fight against this pressure, you can't win. One of the keys to deep free diving is accepting the pressure. You can't think about the depth. You can't think that there are 60, 80, or 100 meters of water above your head. You really have to be mentally flexible. When you reach the bottom and turn around, you enter the most difficult phase of the dive because you start over again with a negative buoyancy. So you feel very heavy at the bottom, and you're going to need to move your fins very energetically during the first 15 or 20 meters of the ascent. As you get closer to the light and the surface, the water becomes warmer. And that lets you know more or less where you are, even without looking at the depth gauge. Then when you reach the last 15 or 20 meters of the ascent, you've got to try to relax as much as possible. At that moment, you really lack oxygen. So you need to slow down your movements as much as possible and use the buoyancy to carry you up towards the surface. One minute. Okay, I said for you at 30, not 40. 30. For the next decade, Fred continues to dive from these makeshift rafts where free divers watch each other with envy. You really learn a lot about yourself, what you're capable of enduring, of achieving. But one day, during a free dive, during the World Championships in 2000, right in the middle of the dive, at around 35 meters, I turned around halfway, because I thought, what am I doing here? I felt I was doing the same thing over and over again. That was a turning point for me. I stopped because I was fed up. Free diving competitions are not very popular, and you need to deal with many things yourself. At one point, I said to myself, that's enough. I knew I had other projects that were taking form, relying on a more natural free diving practice, more in relation with the environment. And that implied spending more time with the animals and exploring the ocean. Fred decides to settle in the middle of the Atlantic, in the Azores, where his passion for diving began. 
When I went to the Azores, I took the books I had read during my childhood, my illustrations. This was very important to me. Then, I did some more research. Books were a revelation to me. They were like companions. It's been a long journey and they're still part of my world. When I plunged back into the old books and atlases, the prints took on a whole new meaning. After several years of free diving, I was able to understand the origin of the legendary sea monsters. Many were born from the navigator's observations, but they only observed the ocean from above the surface. Beneath the foam, the sea was a world of terror and fascination. Of course, it's hard to believe Jonas was swallowed and spit out by a so-called whale. I do not believe in coincidence. The invention of monsters always served a purpose. From several silhouettes glimpsed beneath the surface, sailors created myths. To boost the image of their trade, they invented sea serpents and mermaids. Fanciful descriptions of animals decaying or drifting ended up being transformed into extraordinary creatures. Strangely enough, from one map to the next, the same monsters appeared. They were inspired by real animals. They were much larger than humans and haunted the limits of the known world. Those strange descriptions gave way to much more detailed ones when naturalists were able to observe the giants of the sea at the edge of our world. Just like the dead or dying whales that I saw during my childhood in Belgium. Even today, scientists are still unable to put them back out to sea. But through the systematic study of creatures that are fished or stranded, they have progressively described, classified, and compared the anatomy of animals that inspired those legendary creatures. The humpback whale, for instance. Thanks to scientists, we now know it's a marine mammal, a baleen whale. In this way, the first naturalists progressively killed off the myths. Accidentally, Fred discovers a report by the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. It mentions that more than 40% of sharks are still data deficient, which means more studies are needed to decide their conservation status. Fred's future project takes shape. Why not use his skills as a freediver to bring back photo evidence and information about these sharks? He heads to South Africa, where many sharks are accessible to freedivers in shallow waters.
Off these wild coasts stirred by cold currents and turbid waters, Fred joins a freediver named Steve Benjamin. He has discovered some little-known sharks described as data deficient by the IUCN. He calls them cow sharks. So Fred, we're going to head down into this kelp forest over here, and we're going to swim across the channel to that kelp forest in the distance, you can see it there. Mm -hmm. Now, we can find the cow sharks there. There's, there may be a few, there may be quite a lot. It, it really depends on the day. And they get quite big, sort of half a meter to two and a half meters in length. So there might be some big sharks down there. Okay. But um, yeah, we'll swim to the kelp forest and go see what we can find. Huh? Uh, there can be quite a few. Hey? Um, in summer, when the water gets really warm, you can get up to 30 or 40 at the same time. At the same time? Uh, in the same area. You only ever really see maybe 10 at a time. With these first scientific expeditions, I realized that free diving brings about constant questioning. You always need to adjust. There are unexpected events to which you need to adapt. The shallow waters lying in front of the kelp forest have a surprise in store. Cat sharks. This name designates sharks that are endemic to the South African coastal waters. They often fall victim to fishermen. The IUCN also considers this species at risk, but does not have enough data to determine the protective measures that need to be taken. Can Fred start a survey program with this elusive shark species? Unfortunately, these fish are too small and difficult to find to conduct a proper survey. His studies must focus on accessible marine animals, of a considerably larger size. Animals that can potentially be dangerous to man, like cow sharks. He must go deeper to find them. When I dive, I think there's always that search for inner peace. Especially with free diving, you have to be aware. I open my eyes and see if there are any animals. This face is generally very comfortable. After a while, perhaps 10 seconds, you start to feel the need to breathe. If animals are around, or if something is going on, you either have a choice to continue your free dive, to extend it as much as possible. Or if nothing is happening, you can go back to the surface and start preparing for a new dive. If the free diver is dependent on the air trapped in his lungs to explore the sea depths, what advantage does he have compared to a diver with oxygen? A free diver is extremely discreet, so it's much easier to get close to an animal, and also for the animal to approach us. animal will come to us, and that obviously is the holy grail for a photographer or a cameraman.
With sharks, you generally have to try to establish a relationship. Obviously, it can't be based on power, because we'd lose. But it's a little like playing cat and mouse. If you act like a prey, the shark will tend to get closer to you. But if you take up space in the water, he'll tend to backtrack. You can always try to find that type of balance. These seven gill sharks have a primitive appearance. They have remained unchanged since the age of the dinosaurs. Sadly, with our hooks and nets, we may wipe them out in only a few years. To achieve a census of animal populations, scientists often create photo identification catalogues. Fortunately, the skin of these sharks is spangled with distinctive black and white spots. It looks like each shark wears its own unique pattern. It could be a unique opportunity to complete a census of this sedentary shark population. To include each and every individual, Fred portrays all resident sharks at different periods of the year. He achieves his first contribution to the study of sharks. It's science in the making. Science relies on irrevocable proof. Without proof, there is nothing. While taking pictures of the shark's characteristic markings, Fred Boyle comes up with a hypothesis. How will it hold out when reviewed by South African shark specialist, Megan McCord? Indeed, Fred's photo library is a unique testimony to the diversity of cow sharks and their individual differences. Why is it so? Unfortunately, these spots are not like our fingerprints. Thanks to captive animal studies, Megan McCord has found that their shape, distribution and colors change with time, so that spots can't identify these sharks, which are known to live up to 49 years. Photo identification, however, has recently proved to be a reliable method for identifying another threatened species of shark. Whale sharks, the largest fish of all. Then cutting edge software supports rapid identification using pattern recognition and photo management tools. Replicating the protocol on thousands of whale shark pictures, Fred could prove the added value of free diving for conservation projects. But sure this is a risky bet. Can he really meet enough of these wide-ranging oceanic sharks? Living on a shoestring, he plunges himself into the unknown. Fred heads to Irian Jaya, west of Papua New Guinea. Whale sharks are essentially pelagic but are sometimes found near the coast. They also roam the wild and isolated bay of Senderavasi, east of Indonesia. A local legend talks about large spotted sharks that are protected by benevolent spirits. For Fred, marine legends always contain elements of truth. He tries to follow Megan McCord's advice so that his work can contribute to a vast international survey. The idea is to take a picture of the same part of the shark's body, that is, its left side, around the pectoral fin and gill slits. And thanks to the characteristic marks of each whale shark, we'll be able to identify the individual. What's interesting is that to achieve this, 
scientists use software derived from a program that NASA uses to map constellations. To document these underwater constellations, he must swim as fast as the giants. A near impossible operation at sea. Sharks are too quick. He needs to find an area where the sharks stop to rest in order to get to the bottom of the legend. In the center of Assi Bay, fishermen have installed makeshift boats for a fishing campaign. The Indonesians spend several months on these platforms that they call bagans. They fish at night with the help of powerful lights and nets. Attracted by the lamps, the ikan puri, a species of anchovies, are retained by the fine mesh. Life on board is very simple and remains at the mercy of the electricity angel who intermittently powers a freezer containing the catch of the day. With unreliable power, the fishermen have got used to keeping their anchovies alive in patched up nets. And such a stock of fresh protein inevitably attracts the bay's biggest residents, the whale sharks. An opportunity for Fred and his quest for sedentary whale sharks. But why don't the fishermen hunt the sharks that steal their bread and butter? Is it good to have whale shark around the bagan? Yeah. When we fish at night, the sharks circle around our bagans and gather the anchovies together in our nets. They are our allies. It's thanks to them that our fishing is great. And uh, what's your relation with the whale shark? They are attracted by our lights and follow the baggins as we move on. We attract them with nets full of anchovies and they find us thanks to the smell. As soon as they arrive, we fish an awful lot of anchovies. That's why we never hunt them. Never? No, never. Fred has found a way to dive with the sharks attracted by the tempting net full of anchovies. But how will they react to the presence of an intruder underwater? These timid giants are used to men, but only on their skiffs. Fred remembers what he learned from the dives with the cow sharks. Let the shark approach. Under the bagan, he will use his extraordinary skill as a free diver to arouse the shark's curiosity and take pictures of them.
From one bag end to the next, Fred Boyle enriches the scientific database with hundreds of photos. But this high accessibility of whale sharks hides a difficulty. How can Fred be sure he does not photograph the same animals twice? Simply by identifying the marks, the cuts, or notched fins and scars. Being around whale sharks allows Fred to measure the distance between the reality of these encounters, no matter how magical, and the old representations of these animals. This is typically an animal that can inspire a legend or a myth about sea monsters. The whale shark can measure between 18 and 20 meters. I imagine that back in the 15th or 16th century, some individuals could even reach 22 or 25 meters. Even an animal measuring 15 to 18 meters, if you don't know the creature and have no idea what it is, it's a monster. Also, at the time, they couldn't tell the difference between a white shark and a whale shark when they saw them at sea. So this is typically an animal that could inspire a legend. Also, with its skin with marks and dots, this animal appears quite mysterious. This is really something that could inspire a legend. It seems quite obvious. Here's how you can dream up a sea monster by using the largest fish in the world as inspiration. Take a gigantic whale shark and give it the sharp teeth of small carnivorous sharks. Fred's next expedition takes him to a location filled with sharks that could swallow him whole like Jonas. He's off to Guadalupe Island off Mexico. Around this old volcano scarred by hurricanes roam the world's largest predatory sharks, the Great Whites. Each fall they gather near this fortress of basalt. Fred knows the legendary reputation of these sharks. Will the Great Whites be able to tell the difference between free divers and the seals which make up their diet? He uses his experience to find the answer. I've often had the opportunity to dive with fur seals. They're very graceful and also excellent freedivers. They can dive 400 meters down and stay underwater for up to six minutes. But sharks are opportunistic predators, and seals are a delicacy. Scientists have noticed they synchronize their agenda with that of the elephant seals. The white sharks are uh, patrolling this area in deep waters. And then they come to the surface in front of the seal colony and again to deep waters. They're waiting for these guys uh, from their migration. They come from uh, Alaska. They are here to give birth and to, and to pop. And then they go to Alaska, and in one year they come back again. And the white sharks know that. They have a very, very thick layer of fat. And the white sharks need that because they have high energy requirements. It's an animal which needs quite a bit of food, which moves around a lot, which migrates great distances. It was also overfished for trophies because it's a mythical animal and remains threatened. Mauricio Hoyos expects specific things from us. First of all, photo identification. And it's better if they take a picture from the left side and in the right side, because most of the time the pigmentation is not the same. It could be uh, one thing in, in the left side and another thing in the right side. The second thing he expects us to do is to tag the sharks, either with an acoustic tag, to have an idea of the shark's local behavior, 
or with a satellite tag to trace the shark's movements. Soit des balises satellite pour pouvoir tracer les les déplacements du du requin. Let me know if you're ready. This is cause for hesitation. Is it possible to free dive here without any protection and risk sharing the seal's fate? Can Fred see behind the myth of the killer shark and analyze its behavior? Once a fur seal has located a shark, it'll feel in control and totally comfortable. You often see one or more fur seals swimming around a shark and getting very close to the animal. They feel absolutely no danger. For us, it's pretty much the same. Once we have spotted a shark or group of sharks, we can work in peace because we know where they are and can watch out for their reactions. We'll first get into the water with the cameras to do the work of photo identification. And while doing that, we can assess the situation, see how the sharks are behaving, and what the individuals present are like. The unusual fur seal behavior triggers an idea. Gotta act like a fur seal. Don't fear the sharks. Don't behave as prey. Move towards them. Don't behave as prey. The first time you find yourself in the water without a cage and with a great white shark, the first thought that crosses your mind is, what am I doing here? After 10 seconds, that feeling disappears because you realize that the animal facing you is probably more scared than you are because it doesn't know what you are. It's also very curious and careful. Strangely enough, sharks seem to fear the freediver's presence. If great white sharks were as dangerous as the legends say, they would of course be impossible to dive with. But we've got to demystify these animals. Even if it's a great predator and a dangerous animal, it is possible to be in the water and dive with the white shark. Attaching the tag will be a decisive test. How will the Great White react to the presence of divers bearing spear guns and to being hit by a dart? It's a world first. Before Fred, no one had ever provoked this super predator like this without any protection. At some point, Everyone will have some fear or apprehension. But what's important is to acknowledge this fear and to be honest with one's sensations.
However, during the free dive, the fear disappears. There is no distinction between the body, the thoughts, and the physical sensations. The awareness of one's body and the surrounding environment come together as one. In two weeks, with the help of his assistant, Fred has tagged eight great white sharks. It's a long-term project to get close to these predators and to gain their trust. We're gonna run out of tags with uh, dark. So I think that if you do not know what is below you, that's, that's what scares you. But I think that it's changing. In the 70s, we just had that uh, idea of the stupid animal, the man-eater, the monster. But now we're getting a lot of things about them. And I think that they are not monsters, they are just doing their part in nature. We should get more information about them because we, we are just in time to, to avoid the extinction of the sharks. Scientists estimate that there are only 3,500 great white sharks left in the ocean. This estimate may seem very low, but several studies have come to the same conclusion. They need to be protected, especially in the North American territorial waters. Fortunately, the tags placed by Fred Boyle have helped to resolve the mystery of the white shark's migrations. They gather in Guadalupe Island, but while males return each year, females only visit the island once every two years to mate. Then they stay at sea during the 18 months of their gestation. These studies have enabled the Mexican and American governments to define sanctuaries to protect these sharks that are as charismatic as they are threatened. The tags have revealed that as they get close to the coast of North America to give birth, females are highly exposed to industrial fisheries. The task is huge and the stakes are high. Every year, Fred is back to tag sharks either in Guadalupe or in another location. His reputation now precedes him. But he wants to go further, deeper. Back to where he started his first free dives in the Azores. Beyond the green pastures, the volcanic islands of the Azores are mountains in the sea. These fertile lands arise from foundations several kilometers down below the surface and offer close to the coasts a unique window into the world of the deep. To achieve a childhood dream and to finally meet the ultimate free diver, the sperm whale. To me, the sperm whale is a super animal in more than one sense. As a free diver, of course, it's an inspiration. It's the ocean's greatest diver. It can dive down 3,000 meters and stay underwater for two hours at a time. Sperm whales live in all the oceans of the world, up to the age of 70. But to check the status of their populations, decimated by over three centuries of intensive whaling, Scientists are taking a species census. One of their methods is extremely original, collecting organic matter, giving information on the DNA specific to each animal, like the scraps of skin that these animals sometimes leave in their wake. These patches of skin have the same density as seawater and need to be fished out, a job tailor-made for Fred Boyle. This should be more easily approached by free diving, as I don't make bubbles. These are animals that are very sensitive to sound because their view of the world is an acoustic one. They spend most of their time in the darkness of the abyss, 
listening to anything that moves. On the surface, they can be approached discreetly, as the whalers once did. But underwater, silence and absolute discretion are necessary. Four individuals, did you say before? Uh, yes, we had, we had three. It was one big male uh, standing still. Right. And the one uh, I think the sample is from is a uh, smaller whale. Uh, maybe a juvenile male, male or maybe a female, but probably a juvenile. This survey penetrates the realm of the sperm whale, an acoustic realm. With its forehead, the animal emits and directs waves to detect its prey in the obscurity of the abyss. But what legendary prey can it seize with its huge teeth? A question that remained unanswered for years. For me, the ultimate encounter would be with the giant squid. This animal is a living legend. Ever since my childhood, I've heard stories about these gigantic squids. We think they can measure up to 25 or 30 meters. It's both terrifying and fascinating. But I have a safe plan. So the idea is to go position ourselves in this area where an upwelling current brings up all the nutritious particles. That creates a sort of underwater oasis, and that gives us a chance to see a giant squid. So listen, I'll dive and stay put around minus 50 meters with the lights and the camera. Just use the classic safety procedures. You wait for me when I come back up, and check that the cable doesn't get tangled. When you free dive quite deep, you can feel the nitrogen narcosis that divers also call the rapture of the deep. It's really a way to refocus on myself, to be aware of all of my body's sensations. Fred Boyle is a man facing the unknown. One who conjures his own legends as he realizes that nothing in nature can be taken for granted. The only monsters that survive today are his own chimeras, our own chimeras. The ghosts of our imagination, ephemeral visions that bring us face to face with our ignorance. Close, next to the 
Paradoxically, this weakness may be our most precious gift. Yes. 